Hello and welcome. Bandits abduct over 300 secondary school girls in Niger State. Governor Matawale orders closure of all boarding schools. You are not too strong to be defeated. President Muhammadu Buhari warns bandits and their sponsors, cautions governors against rewarding bandits. More condemnation trails abduction of over 300 secondary school girls. Opposition PDP, UNICEF and SEREP seek urgent action. And U.S. releases intelligence report indicts Saudi Crown Prince in murder of exiled journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. Plus we'll have business, sports and later on international news from our London studios. On business news tonight, Vice President Yamil Shibajo calls for regulation of cryptocurrencies transaction following its recent ban by the central bank. And on sports news tonight, the Principals' Cup returns after more than a decade as official kickoff ceremony, as official kickoff ceremony takes off, takes place in Lagos. And from Abuja, federal government announces plans to begin free emergency medical and ambulance services across the country. Today, Nigerians woke up to the news of another abduction involving schoolgirls, but this time in Zamfara State. 317 students from the Government Girls Secondary School in Jangebe in Talata, Mafara local government area of the state, were abducted by bandits around 1 a.m. But the latest update from the town is that seven of the abducted girls have escaped from the bandits while trekking in the forest. The returnees also confirmed that some other girls also escaped during the early morning trek and may return home soon. Meanwhile, police authorities in Zamfara State say they are now on the trail of the kidnappers and are interfacing with other security agencies to rescue the students. The school attack comes just over a week after a similar one on a school for boys in Niger State. Gunmen stormed the Government Girls Secondary School, Jangebe, in the wee hours of Friday, abducting 317 students. Hours after the incident, the Zamfara State Police Command, led by the Police Commissioner, made their way to Jangebe, which is about two hours' drive from the state capital. The team makes a stop at this forest area, believed to be the escape route of the abductors. They take position, scouting the area. It's an established fact that students were kidnapped and we're on the trail of the kidnappers. That's why you find us in the fringes of the forest here. It's part of our locational efforts and it's part of our cordoning efforts in order to retrace the... Um, to trace the kidnappers and retrieve the students. Attempts to drive into the community is swathed by angry villagers who attacked visitors, including journalists, damaging their vehicles in the process. An action condemned by the journalist union. While we were there, we saw the, some vehicles belonging to security men about five, six kilometers away from the village. But we dared ourselves that we, we could enter into the village and we went in. It was when we were in the center of the town that one of our colleagues said we had already passed the affected school. So we were trying to turn and go back to the school when the residents, including men, women and children, started throwing stones and sticks against our vehicles. That led to one of our colleagues who was hit with a rock on the forehead and we had to rush him back to Gusau where he was stitched. The rescue of the children is topmost priority. And the Commissioner of Police says he will do everything possible to get the students back. And we are working on all available intels in order to ensure that they return back to safety. Naturally, criminality is a galloping situation. Therefore, the tendency for traces of criminality to ebb up and come low is always there. But the bottom line of it all is that at the end of the day, we hope to have a situation 
of more positives than negatives. The attack is coming less than 24 hours after Dankurumi community in Maru, local government area of the state, was attacked and also hours after the governor received some repentant bandits who embraced amnesty. Meanwhile, the force headquarters have deployed two civilians helicopters to Jangebe and its environs as well in search of the abducted girls. The statement from the force, Public Relations Officer Frank Mba, says the civilians helicopters will complement the efforts of Operation Puff Adder. According to him, the Inspector General of Police, Mohammed Adamu, has also condemned the abduction, describing it as barbaric and callous. He says the joint rescue operation is being carried out by the police, the military and other members of the law enforcement community with supports from the state government and other stakeholders. And shortly after the abduction, the Zamfara state governor, Bello Matawale, ordered the immediate closure of all boarding schools across the state following the abduction at Jangebe. In a statewide broadcast, Governor Matawale asked parents and guardians of the missing girls to be patient as the government is committed to rescuing them. It was a heavy heart that I address you this evening on the unfortunate incident of abduction of students of Government Girls Secondary School, Jangebe, in the Latimafra local government area of the state. At this trying moment, it is most appropriate for all men and women of good conscience to extend emotional support to the families of the abducted girls. On behalf of the government of Zampara State, I wish to extend my deep sympathy to the families of the abductees and the entire people of Jangebi and the Latimer local government over these sad incidents. I wish to assure everyone that we are wholly committed to ensuring a speedy rescue of our dear school girls and reuniting them with their families. Since when I received the sad news yesterday by one o'clock, I have been making contact with the security agencies and other relevant individuals and the group toward rescuing these young girls. I also call on people to be more security conscious and report any suspicious individuals or activities to the relevant authority. As we are making effort to strengthen security around our schools, I have directed the immediate closure of all boarding secondary schools across the state today. <laughs> Now we're staying with the girls' abduction as the Sokoto State Governor Aminu Tambawal and the Sultan of Sokoto Saada Bubakar have visited the Zamfara State Governor Bello Matawale to commiserate with him and the people of the state over the abduction. After the meeting, Governor Tambawal told journalists that since the bandits have refused to repent, the government will have to expedite action on ending the attacks. <coughs> on hearing the very sad news very unfortunate, very highly condemnable uh, development of the abduction of uh, about 300 uh, students of uh, Government Girls College Jangebe. It's unfortunate. We are here to commiserate uh, with the government and people of Zamfara State, and our prayers are with these children that uh, may they return back to their respective families uh, in good health and safety. Those who are enemies of this country are unrelenting. Despite uh, our long hours of meeting yesterday, trying to find lasting solutions to these problems, and our community thereafter, wherein we stated and restated our commitment to two prone approaches to this uh, challenge of non-kinetic and kinetic uh, approach, uh, yet they are still unrelenting. Uh, so we show that um, they are unrelenting. We too must double up and uh, up our game aimed at checkmating them and uh, nipping this in the bud. The president has also condemned the abduction of the Zamfara schoolgirls, describing it as inhumane and totally unacceptable. 
The president says his government will not succumb to blackmail by bandits who target innocent school students in expectation of huge ransom as he sends out a strong warning to bandits and their sponsors. The president's statement reads in part, no criminal group can be too strong to be defeated by the government, adding that the only thing standing between our security forces and the bandits are the rules of engagement. We have the capacity to deploy massive force against the bandits in the villages where they operate, but our limitation is the fear of heavy casualties of innocent villagers and hostages who might be used as human shields by the bandits. The president further said that his government's primary objective is to get the hostages safe, alive and unharmed. The president further says, let them not entertain any illusions that they are more powerful than the government. They shouldn't mistake our restraint for the humanitarian goals of protecting innocent lives as a weakness or a sign of fear or irresolution. The president appealed to state governments to review their policy of rewarding bandits with money and vehicles, warning that the policy might boomerang disastrously. He also advised states and local governments to be more proactive by improving security around schools and their surroundings. We have more reactions to the Zamfara school abduction and the opposition People's Democratic Party is also condemning the incident. In a statement, the party notes that the spate of abduction and terrorism in the country validates concerns that the All Progressives Congress and its administration do not have the solutions to the current insecurity. The party calls for a full-scale investigation into the latest school abduction saying criminals have now taken abduction of school children and other vulnerable citizens for ransom as a lucrative business. The party notes, Indeed, our party weeps over the unfortunate situation that our nation is being plunged into by the incompetent, deceptive and uncoordinated APC and its administration that not only caused the escalation of acts of terrorism in our country, but also failed to run an effective command structure to secure the nation. According to the PDP, the president should ensure the immediate rescue of the abducted students. Meanwhile, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, is worried about the government girls' secondary school abduction. UNICEF representative in Nigeria, Peter Hawkins, said in a statement that the UN body is angered and saddened by yet another brutal attack on school children in Nigeria. The statement reads in part, This is a gross violation of children's rights and a horrific experience for children to go through one which could have long-lasting effects on their mental health and well-being. We utterly condemn the attack and call on those responsible to release the girls immediately and for the government to take steps to ensure their safe release and the safety of all other school children in Nigeria. Mr. Hawkins adds that UNICEF acknowledges efforts by the Nigerian government to secure the release of the kidnapped school children but wants them to intensify such efforts to make schools safe. And for the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, an open letter to the United Nations Security Council and its members to urgently hold a special session on Nigeria is one of the options available to end the crisis. SERAP is also asking the UN Security Council to visit Nigeria to press the government to end continuing abductions of students and the increasing level of insecurity across the country. The organization is also urging the UN Security Council and members to treat the failure of Nigerian authorities to prevent and prosecute attacks on students as a fundamental breach of the UN Charter and Nigeria's international human rights obligations. Serap adds that attacks on schools and abduction of students are a violation of children's rights, noting that Nigeria has legal obligations to ensure the immediate release of the abducted students, teachers and family members, provide the necessary counselling following the traumatic experience and bring the perpetrators to justice. In part two, after the break, victims of police brutality demand 710 million naira compensation from the police. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. 
If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Bandits abduct over 300 secondary school girls in Niger State. Governor Matawale orders closure of all boarding schools. You're not too strong to be defeated. President Muhammadu Buhari warns bandits and their sponsors, cautions governors against rewarding bandits. More condemnation trails abduction of over 300 secondary school girls. Opposition PDP, UNICEF and SERAP seek urgent action. And U.S. releases intelligence report indicts Saudi Crown Prince in murder of exile journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. The coalition of northern groups is accusing governors in northern Nigeria of being docile regarding insecurity in the region. The group says the governors should take a cue from what governors in other regions are doing about securing their people and come up with ideas that will tackle the challenges. It also restates its support for amnesty to bandits who are ready to lay down their weapons and advise, as advised by Islamic scholar Sheikh Ahmad Gumi. If we look at it, they have colleagues in the southwest. Their colleagues in the southwest took every step to register a regional security outfit. Why can't the northern governors initiate such a move? Because what they are docile, simple, they are not handicapped at all. Because there are legal uh, legal clauses that could be maneuvered to achieve. So what we are saying is, if successive administrations would employ initiatives like the NTDC, the Amnesty Program, and, and, and many other programs in order to, to, to uh, the Niger Delta Ministry, in order to, to checkmate a particular problem that is peculiar to a certain region, there is no reason why this one should be questioned if it would bring about less than solution. And following the abduction of over 300 schoolgirls in neighboring Zambara State, Kano State is taking precautionary measures and has ordered the immediate closure of 10 boarding schools located on the fringes of the state. The State Commissioner for Education, Mohamed Kiru, explained in a statement that the decision is to ensure that the children are protected from any unforeseen circumstances. He also urged parents to bear with the state government concerning the decision, which he says is for their own good. Mr. Kiru said the schools will resume when the situation is brought under control. Let's cross over to Abuja now, and here's Gloria Umezoke. Gloria. Jama, welcome to the nation's capital. Two large... Well, two victims of alleged police brutality in Abuja are demanding 710 million naira as compensation from the Nigeria police force over alleged disappearance, arbitrary arrest, prolonged unlawful detention, torture and inhuman treatment. As the resumed sitting of the National Human Rights Independent Investigative Panel, the victims adopted their petitions accusing the police of extrajudicial killing, which led to the death of Lukman Salihu and Simon Yangkwange. The victims also alleged that the police refused to release the corpses of their relations since 2020 for burial. It is the continuation of sitting of the independent investigative panel of the National Human Rights Commission. Five petitions are listed for hearing as petitioners are called upon to adopt their petitions. The first petitioner for the day narrates his ordeal in the hands of the police on the enforced disappearance of his son since April 2020 as he demands 5 million naira compensation. All these they have not complied with the order. For unlawful detention, yes. 
The second petitioner who claimed he paid 203,000 naira for the release of his elder brother's corpse also shares his experience. Just as another petitioner who was detained for 20 days over allegation of a stolen laptop makes a demand of 10 million naira compensation. We now came to Wusses on three police station. Getting there, it was around 4 p.m. Then the IPO, I asked of the IPO of the matter, then, then, to, then showed me one Mr. Ibrahim, and I met him and I asked him. I, I received a call that my elder brother was shot. What happened? Where is him? So that I will ask, my brother was shot at Antenna Filling Station in Wuse 2 in the night, and he was called to come and carry him. He, he brings him to the station, and he bleeded and died. The second responder, I feel Brian, told you that the corpse is where? He's in Wuse General Hospital. Oh. But he didn't at an assessment to my late brother's corpse. He only showed me his ID card, his ATM, and his uh, driving license because he, is a, he was a driver. We were in the meeting around 4 o'clock. A security approached me and asked me that my attention was needed outside. On, on getting to the, bending, so sorry, to, the, to the place where they invited me, the police officer attached to the NICOR logs recall, sorry, uh, interrogate me that I should tell them the truth of the way about. In fact, I was somehow confused because I don't know anything about the laptop. So they still insist that if I'm not ready to tell them the truth, they should take me to SAS. So at SAS, when we go to the when we, when we go to the uh, SAS office, uh, the man, sorry, the the, the the officer handling the case in person of Amadin, in fact, he just kept us there for two days. Was out giving, sorry, was out providing any food for us. After the testimony of the petitioners, the panel orders the police to respond to the allegations and it adjourn hearing to the 7th and 8th of April 2020. Well, meanwhile, the Lagos State's Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS-related Abuses and Other Matters also continued its sitting today with 11 cases scheduled for hearing. Three cases witnessed further hearings, while others were adjourned to later dates. Friday's proceedings at the Lagos State's Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS-related Abuses and Other Matters witnessed further hearing of three cases. One was between Mr. Tela Adesoya and the Nigeria Police Force. The respondent brought in a witness, Destiny Ibakumun, who was the investigative police officer in charge of the case. According to her, on June the 17th, 2018, a hit and run case was reported by one Femi Agbola at Iba Police Station Although the victim, Jim Okazim, was taken to the hospital, he died six months later due to discontinued medical treatment arising from the inability of the petitioner to continue payment of bills. The petitioner, Mr. Adesoya, who appeared for his own defence, said he was not responsible for the accident, although he took up the victim's medical expenses. The people that was around there, some bike men, the civilian, they chased him and met him where there was a stop and search policeman at a garden police station. They now reported to the police officer that was searching him that he knocked somebody down at Iba Junction. And that one of things, visiting the scene of accident, you never asked me. You never asked me for Sorry, that. Listen. Your answer to this brought up another question. As a police officer, they want to convince an accused person that yes, this allegation is true about you. Must I ask you to take me to the scene of the accident? Where is on the spot assessment when incidents occur? Another case was between Afiz Mojid and the Federal Special Anti-Robbery Squad. The panel had requested that the petitioner bring forth his business banking statement to get to the root of issues in his petition. To retrieve my bank uh, statement of account from Diamond Bank, I was being told to um, submit some documents which had part of those documents that the police 
SAS people took away from my house illegally. I have all the documents listed. Let's assume police have them. It behoves on the petitioner to write to CAC. I need a copy of my citizen document. Because of the don't get granted, granted them, he is now referring to the witness, he now goes to CAC. My lord, we are not going to live here forever. If that is the case, he who seeks a pity must do a pity. It's the property you are taking away, produce it for us. Eleven cases were scheduled for hearing, but most were adjourned to later days due to the absence of the petitioners, non appearance of counsel, or other reasons. The federal government has announced plans to commence free emergency medical and ambulance services across the country. The Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Ehanire, announced the plans during a retreat organized by the House of Representatives Committee on Health Care Services on the amendment of the 2014 National Health Act. According to the minister, the federal government is pulling all ambulances together to form the National Emergency Man Medical Service and Ambulance System NEMSAS, which will be launched within the next one month. Dr. Osage says by dialing the emergency code 112, Nigerians can access medical emergency ambulance services within minutes at no cost. Our correspondent, Terry Ikumi, reports. Members of the House of Representatives Committee on Health Care Services are attending a three-day retreat on amendment of the National Health Act 2014. The Act provides for the regulation, development and management of Nigeria's health system. The amendments will incorporate the new challenges, especially on combating pandemics, incorporation of health research, health security and building resilience in the nation's health system. Unlike ever before in human history, we must ensure that our healthcare system at home is robust enough to accommodate and respond to this reality. At the inception of COVID-19, chronic diseases and their sufferers suffered a lot of neglect to the extent that mortality related to the chronic disease outnumbered the death as a result of COVID-19. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. My car will finish tomorrow. We'll go out. Thank you for finding time to come. Come. As I am talking to you now. One of the national parks. The Minister of Health announces an improvement in medical emergency services across the country. We are pulling together all the ambulances in the country, both private, public, institutional, to form the national emergency medical service and ambulance system, NEMSAS, which will be launched as a, as a pilot in, uh, in, in FCT within the next one month. Now, mobile penetration in Nigeria is over 80 percent. We are working in Nigeria Communication Commission. If you dial 112, they refer you to medical, and you tell us where your problem is, is geolocated, and we look for the nearest ambulance. The ambulance comes to you, you get first aid, and you do not pay. This is very important. There is no payment at point of service. The person will be seen to and taken. For some participants, there is a need for proper implementation of the Basic Health Care Provision Fund, which was launched in 2019 by President Muhammad Buhari, as well as consideration for private health sector participation in the composition of the National Council on Health. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Gloria. The governor of Edo State, Godwin Obaseke, is making a case for renewable energy as an alternative to the regular power supply in the country, particularly rural communities. Governor Obaseke, who disclosed this at an interactive session with solar energy operators in Bini City, the Edo State capital, explains that renewable energy will provide the right competition for electricity tariff pricing, which he believes is likely to go up. I think the time is now for us to take renewable energy seriously. 
with electricity tariffs likely to go up, I believe that in terms of costing, renewable energy should now be market competitive in terms of pricing. So it's not a grant. It's not one subsidized, totally subsidized arrangement. And this way, we, we can electrify our country. We can electrify the rural communities. Yes, we have gas. We have a lot of thermal, uh, uh, thermal electricity in and around the state. But there are so many underserved communities. I went around the 192 wards of the state during my electioneering, and most of our communities were in darkness. And I committed and I made a promise to them that we're going to bring lights. We are a government of light. And therefore, we're going to partner with the federal government, with the IRE agency, to make sure that we get light to our people. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Teniola Shobowale. Thanks a lot, Ijoma. Welcome to Business News. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, has lent his voice to the issues surrounding the recent ban on cryptocurrency transaction by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Speaking at an economic summit today in Lagos, the Vice President says there should be proper regulation and not an outright ban on digital assets by the CBN. I fully appreciate the position of the CBN, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and some of the anti-corruption agencies on the possible abuses of, crypto of, of cryptocurrencies and their other well-articulated concerns. But I believe that their position should be the subject of further reflection. There's a role for regulation here, and it is in the place of our monetary authorities and SEC to provide a robust regulatory regime that addresses these serious concerns without necessarily killing the goose that might lay the golden eggs. So it should be thoughtful and knowledge-based regulation, not prohibition in my view. The point I'm making is that some of the exciting developments we see call for prudence and care in adopting them. And this has been very well articulated by our regulatory authorities. But we must act with knowledge and not with fear. The central bank says it's implementing a demand management framework in order to support improved local production of items, as well as conserve the country's external reserves, which has been on the decline due to the lower foreign exchange earnings. At an event in Lagos, the governor of the CBN, Mr. Gordon Mefele, mentioned that the drop in crude oil earnings and the reduction in foreign portfolio inflows significantly affected the supply of forex into Nigeria. With the decline in our foreign exchange earnings and subsequent adjustments in value of the Naira vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. dollar, the CBN has continued to implement a demand management framework which is designed to support improved production of items and goods that can be produced in Nigeria and further conservation of our external reserves. These measures have helped to prevent a significant decline in our reserves. Our external reserves currently stand at over $35 billion and is sufficient to cover more than seven months of imports of goods and services, even though the international rule of thumb is for reserves to cover about three months, three months of imports. The benchmark index of Nigeria's stock market has dropped below the 40,000 level on the last trading day of the month, with year-to-date return of equities down by 1.2%. Ekaite Afia tells us more. Thanks for joining us for the Stock Market Report. February will go down as one of the most turbulent months for investors in the domestic equities market this year. And I say this because the month ends the last trading day deeper in the red due to intense profit-taking activities. 
I mean, there you have it. With that growl, the bear went wilder in today's trading session as it bid off 0.74% from the market's main index, which has now dropped below the 40,000 level, while an additional 155 billion Naira is knocked off from the overall value of listed equities. Now, the latest round of sell pressure, which has eroded the only two gains recorded within the month, affected the shares of 25 equities across the four sectors of the market, particularly the insurance counter. And a trader I spoke with today earlier about the continued downturn explained that investors are still trying to make a last-minute profit-taking in some high-value equities, while some are still trading cautiously while they await the release of fourth quarter and full-year results for 2020. Meanwhile, the volume of shares traded today was significantly higher in contrast to the previous sessions in the week at 507.25 million units. And this was largely driven by the shares of Wema Bank. Well, that's all for the stock market report. I'm Akaite Afia. Back to you. And that's business news tonight. I'm Tenyo La Shobo Ale. It's back to you, Ijoma. A U.S. intelligence report has implicated Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the murder of exiled journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. The declassified report released by the Biden administration says the prince approved the plan to either capture or kill the U.S.-based Saudi exile. Khashoggi was murdered while visiting the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Let's head over to our London studios now, where Simon Puzi has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The U.S. military has carried out an airstrike targeting Iran-backed militias in Syria in the first military action undertaken by the Biden administration. We're confident in, uh, in the target that we went after. We know what we did. The Pentagon said the strike was ordered in response to attacks against U.S. and coalition personnel in Iraq, saying the action destroyed multiple facilities used by Iranian-backed Iraqi militant groups. Militia officials said one person had been killed, but a war monitor reported at least 22 fatalities. It came after a civilian contractor was killed in a rocket attack on U.S. targets earlier this month. New witnesses report that Eritrean troops fighting in Ethiopia's northern region of Tigray killed hundreds of people in Aksum. The international NGO Amnesty International reports the mass killings in November may amount to a crime against humanity. Ethiopia and Eritrea, which both officially deny Eritrean soldiers are in Tigray, have not commented. The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission says the report should be taken seriously and that it was investigating the allegations. Protests continue in the capital of Myanmar despite a heavy military presence after the army coup that deposed the democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Protesters sat behind makeshift barricades in the capital, Norpidor. The army has promised a new election but has not set a date. A vote is not expected until after a one-year state of emergency the military imposed when it seized power on February the 1st. The UK Supreme Court has ruled that a British-born woman who went to Syria as a schoolgirl to join Islamic State should not be allowed to return to Britain because she poses a security risk. Shamima Begum left London in 2015 when she was just 15 and went to Syria via Turkey with two school friends where she married an Islamic State fighter. Begum, who is being held in a detention camp in Syria, was stripped of her British citizenship in 2019. The Court of Appeal previously agreed she could only have a fair appeal of that decision if she were allowed back to Britain. An explosion has destroyed a cafe building and injured at least three people in a Russian city 400 kilometers east of Moscow. The blast in Nizhny Novgorod occurred in the annex of a 12-storey residential building where the cafe was located. At least three people sustained injuries. It wasn't immediately clear what caused the explosion. Queen Elizabeth has urged the public to think about other people and get the COVID jab when they are offered one. Once you've had the vaccine, you have a feeling of, uh, you know, you're, you're protected, which is, I think, very important. 
The British monarch, who is 94, received her first dose of the vaccine in January with her husband, Prince Philip. In a video call with health leaders delivering the COVID vaccine, she said she understood getting a jab could be a difficult experience for some people, but urged everyone to think about other people rather than themselves. It is obviously difficult for people to, if they've never had a vaccine. A group of Russian diplomats and their families have made a rather unusual exit out of North Korea on a hand-pushed rail trolley due to COVID measures. The eight people travelled by train and bus before pushing themselves across the Russian border for about one kilometre over train tracks. North Korea has blocked most passenger transport to limit the virus's spread. And finally, NASA rover Perseverance has sent new stunning 360-degree pictures from Mars. Here's how we laid out the panorama. You see how the images started. taken by Perseverance show mountains in the distance and rock formations seemingly shaped by exposure to the elements over the course of billions of years. Perseverance travelled through the thin Martian atmosphere to a gentle touchdown last week inside a vast basin called Jezero Crater. NASA presented a brief audio clip on Monday captured by microphones on the rover after its arrival that included the murmur of a light wind gust, the first ever recorded on the fourth planet from the sun. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Well, Simon, let's take a look at some sports. Here's Olumide Macaulay. Thank you, Joma. Hello and welcome to Sports News. The rebranded National Principal Cup has kicked off with the opening match between Igbobi College of Lagos and Government College Kaduna at the Agege Stadium. The Minister of Youth and Sports Development, Sunday Dari, the Minister of State for Education, Emeka Wajuba, the Deputy Governor of Edo State, Philip Shaibu, and ex-internationals flagged off the revamped secondary school competition earlier today. In the opening game of the competition, Igbobi College forced visiting Government College Kaduna to a one-all draw. <laughs> Manchester United have been drawn against AC Milan in the standout tie of the Europa League Round of 16 clash that will see Zlatan Ibrahimovic return to Old Trafford. In a repeat of last season's Round of 32 fixture, Olympiacos and Arsenal will face off again with the Greek side prevailing the last time out. In other pairings, Tottenham are set to face Dynamo Zagreb. Slavio Prague and Rangers will meet in a clash involving three Super Eagles players. Ajax versus Young Boys will hold. It's also Dynamo Kiev against Villarreal. Roma will take on Shakhtar Donetsk and Granada will play Malt. The eight last 16 ties will be played on March the 11th and the 18th. Also in football, Chelsea manager Thomas Tuckle says he's well aware of the challenge posed by Manchester United, who sits six points and three spots above his team in the EPL. Ahead of Sunday's clash at, Old, at Stamford Bridge, he admits his team are not finished goods yet. Chelsea are unbeaten in eight matches in all competitions since the German took over. And that's it on Sports News. Ijama, back to you. Thanks a lot, Olumide. And the main news again. Bandits today abducted over 300 secondary school girls in Zamfara State. The state governor, Bello Matawale, has ordered the immediate closure of boarding schools in the state. Seven of them escaped. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Kunyato. Do have a great weekend, but stay safe while you try to do that. Good night.